Six Music. Telling the stories in music that matter. Now, Six Music Documentaries present Chinny Chap. Hi, I'm Susie Quattro, and for the next hour or so, I'm going to be your guide on the Kitsch Express as we take a ride down Devilgate Drive back to the days of glam rock and bubblegum, a time when men wore the makeup and women wore the leather trousers. Well, I did anyway, and it was a time when the pop single still counted for something, a time when Mike Chapman and Nicky Chen, two guys from different backgrounds, came together to create the first UK-based production line, writing and producing songs for people like Sweet, Smokey, Mud, Tina Turner, Blondie, and me. Welcome to Chinny Chap, a journey into the heart of glam rock and beyond. And oh, I just couldn't resist starting like this. Are you ready, Steve? Uh huh. Andy? Yeah. Mick? Okay. okay. I would say they were the biggest pop producers in this country and Europe probably for the 70s really. Like the stock ache in a mortarman of the 70s. Oh, it's been so hard, Their only aim was to have hit records. I don't see anything wrong with that at all. Oh, yes. That were great pop singles. They were good fun records as well. Great dance records. Great radio records. I can't ask for more than that. There were literally hundreds and thousands of other people trying to do the same thing at the same time, and they didn't make it. So one's got to say, well, hang on, these guys are good. The great slices of pop you've just heard a group of middle-aged men getting hot under the collar about were written and more often than not produced by Mike Chapman and Nicky Chin. Mike was a straight-talking Queenslander, and Nicky was a typical English ex-public schoolboy. And together they called themselves Chinny Chap. In the early and mid-70s, Chinny Chap dominated the music industry, and Mike Chapman went on to dominate quite a chunk of the 80s as well. In one week in 1974, the top three singles were all Chinny Chap songs, and that's nearly a quarter of all singles sold in Britain. In those days, that wasn't a small amount. It meant a million or more singles in one week. Mud's Tiger Feet was at number one, at number three was Teenage Rampage by Sweet, and guess who was happily sandwiched between those nice boys at number two? Yeah, you knew it. That was yours truly with Devilgate Drive, and I did get to number one, by the way. Hey, y'all want to go down to Devilgate? Anyway, what I'm saying is, Chin and Chapman have had a hell of a lot of hits, and that's why we're telling you their story, okay? Let's go. Like so many rock and roll tales, this one really begins in the mid-60s. But unlike almost all of them, it started in Australia, where one young Queenslander harbored serious pop ambitions. And so along with people like Wolf Harris, The Easy Beats, and Clive James, he decided that migrating to London was the thing to do if you were an Aussie with ambitions in the popular arts. Here's Mike Chapman. All I ever cared about was music. There was nothing in Australia that was powerful enough to actually keep me there. So I had to get out of there and I had to go somewhere. I jumped on a plane, flew across the world, and landed in London. In the middle of probably uh, one of the most exciting times uh, London has ever seen. Having settled in London's Earl's Court, Mike got on with getting a band together. It was called Tangerine Peel, not to be confused with progressive rock group Tangerine Dream. I started writing songs in 1967, 68, based on a catchy hook. It was based on uh, a title that would uh, catch people's ears. It was really the birth of what I was going to go on to do. It was in 1970 that Chapman met Chin. Nicky was as polished and as charming as a car salesman, which wasn't surprising, as that is what he was doing for a living at the time. But as well as selling cars, he was also driven, no pun intended. You see, Nicky was an aspiring and ambitious lyricist, who had already come up with a number of songs for the Peter Sellers movie, Girl in My Soup. Nicky Chin suddenly appeared in my life. He was uh, 
hanging out in the club, told me he was trying to write songs. I said, well, hey, let's uh, give it a shot and try it together. Which we did just a few days later. Uh, I always remember it was a beautiful day in June. He came to my flat. We got started writing some pretty goofy, silly things. All of which were no good. But that wasn't really the issue. We knew there was a chemistry. Singles made big money, and the music biz attracted a lot of skilled songwriters to it. Woke up this morning, feeling fine. Success might still be a long way from Nicky Chin's flat, even if it was in Mayfair. In fact, success was just around the corner in Charles Street. Nicky Chin did what he did best. He whined, dined, and charmed the right person, and acquired the home phone number of one of the biggest men in pop, Rack Records boss, Mickey Most. Most had made hits for the Animals and Hermit's Hermits, just to name a few. Nikki secured an appointment for Mike and himself to see Most. Here's Mike and Nikki remembering a scene that must have looked like an audition for 1960s Pop Idol. We had, I think, five songs to play him. Mickey kept saying, no, no, don't like that. Anything else? And I said, well, here's a sort of bizarre little song about Red Indians. He said, fantastic. That's a hit. Tom, Tom, turn around, don't. That soon-to-be hit was Tom Tom Turnaround. Mickey Most gave it to Rack Act, New World, and the vocal trio took it to number six in July 1971. Tom Tom wasn't Chinny Chap's first hit, but it was their first for Rack Records, the label with which they became most closely associated. Mike and Nicky had given an earlier song to a band called Sweet, formed by singer Brian Connolly and drummer Mick Tucker, both of whom sadly are no longer with us. Like the New World single, the song Chinny Chap gave to Sweet was catchy, alliterative, and kind of silly. The pop world had a name for this type of music, and it was called bubblegum. And for a while, Mike Chapman became a bubblegum genius. But Funny Funny wasn't just saccharin, it was sugar sugary. Sugar. Oh, honey, honey. Here's Mike to explain what I mean. Funny Funny was a tribute to Sugar Sugar, wonderful record. Sweets producer, Phil Wayman. Mike and I went into the studio and did three demos. One of the songs was Funny Funny. And Phil said, I've got a band. They would be great singing this song. Tell me, is it really true? This feeling that I feel for you. Nicky Chin. He put us together with them, which of course was the start of a very long run. And then we signed them with RCA. And it's so funny, funny what you do, honey. Here's sweet guitarist Andy Scott, who didn't join the band until after Funny Funny. But don't let that little fact put you off. In those days, it wasn't unusual for records to be released without any members of the band playing on them. So the fact that Andy wasn't in Sweet at the time didn't really matter. None of the boys played on the record. They just provided the vocals and harmonies. When we all got together, all the backing tracks were all in place for some of the early stuff, because apparently Phil had earmarked Brian to go and sing some demos for Nicky and Mike. The first single was from that original demo session and Funny Funny was obviously the best track from the half dozen that they'd recorded. We cut the track and the track sounded fantastic. And you know, honey, honey, though it's so funny, funny that you mean all the world to me. Chitty Chap's career went off like a rocket. We first started working in June of 1970. We had our first hit in under nine months or around nine months from being together, which is, is quick. They were hungry, exciting times. Now I gotta tell the world about you. Mike Chapman did the lion's share of the songwriting, originally on a battered old guitar with only four strings. Nicky Chin helped out, but was kept busy wheeling and dealing with record companies in the media. The pair provided a string of hits for Sweet, which producer Phil Wayman cut with session musicians. According to Phil, Mike had a genius for emulating the hit formula of the day. Mike Chapman's talent was writing to order, and that's spot genius. It was bubblegum, and Sweet developed not a bubblegum band at all. The band was really a rock band, seriously uh, loud and aggressive and all about attitude. Funny, funny, it was about attitude, but not their attitude. So it was like uh, chalk and cheese. But Sweet's production team continued to ignore the band's rock aspirations and came up with a song that sounded like Montego Bay, but with an even more stupid chorus, if that's possible. 
we figured, well, let's just stick with the format. When I first wrote uh, the chorus of Coco, they all looked at me. They said, what does that mean? I said, it doesn't mean anything. Just sing it and shut up. And it was a bit of fun. Ho Chi Coco Ho. I mean, you know, there was nothing serious about what we did, but it sounded all right. Go, go, go. But Sweet were much too good a set of musicians to be kept off their own records forever. And when they finally started to play on them, the records got harder and sharper. It wasn't until uh, Little Willie that Phil, who was still the producer at this point, said, OK, maybe the band can play on their records now. Rec will start to sound better, really. Little Willie was the beginning of the real sweep. Little Willie was Sweet's second top five hit and their biggest American seller, reaching number three. It sold between three and four million copies, so Little Willie scored big bucks. The song's success showed Mike and Nikki that they could tailor their songs to Sweet's changing image. From Little Willie into Wigwam Bam into Blockbuster, the Sweet were starting to turn into what they had always wanted to be. It still wasn't quite heavy enough for them. It was still a bit too melodic. It was still a bit too catchy. I used to say to them, you can't have a hit if it's not catchy. People are not going to buy it if, if you can't remember it. I didn't bother too much. country was in a lot of trouble. Naughty Holder. When glam rock came along, it gave people a chance to get out of their everyday lives, to dress up in colourful clothes. It was fantasy land. It was power pop. That's what it was. From being pop, it became power pop. Power pop sort of led into glam rock. Sweet's guitarist Andy Scott. We started to overdo the makeup. We'd come across people who just thought that we were homosexual and we started to camp it up a little bit. We weren't the first doing glam rock. Mark Boland, that was his thing. And he was doing his thing, and then the boys said, well, let's let's drag it up a bit. I remember being screamed at by some skinheads in Kilmarnock and all they did was they spat for half an hour onto the stage while we were playing. Which explains why the boys often wore capes. Anyway, glam rock was a welcome relief from the earnest self-importance of rock acts such as Led Zeppelin and Genesis. It was tongue-in-cheek and it wore too much makeup and shiny clothes and the headline grabbers were Sweet and their Wolverhampton buddies Slade. Mike Chapman was always on the lookout for any novelty that would make a Chinny Chap song stand out from the competition. Jingles, hooks, intros, sound effects, Elvis impersonations, they were all designed to grab the listener's attention when played on the radio. The siren at the start of Blockbuster certainly did the trick. From that moment on, we knew we had something. The song was basically about some little dude called Buster. He's trying to get away from the cops. Because of this cops and robbers sort of vibe, I thought, let's put a siren on the front of it. To me, the depth of meaning in those songs really wasn't that important. It was the words and the way they sounded and the way they fit with the music that was important. Sweet's most outrageous character was bassist Steve Priest, the non-denominational vicar of glam. Mike Chapman's tricks owed more than a little to Steve Priest's antics. We just haven't got a clue what to do. Here's Andy Scott. Well, maybe that was the extra yard that was needed to make Blockbuster, you know, the siren, Steve bits, you know, all that kind of stuff, to make it a number one, you know? At the start of 1973, Blockbuster became Chinny Chap and Sweet's first UK number one. In 1973, a showbiz agent persuaded Chinny Chap to watch a band of easy-going Londoners who had been playing the club circuit for years. Chinny Chap, flushed with success from Sweet, liked what they saw. Mud, singer Les Gray, drummer Dave Mount, guitarist Rob Davis, and bassist Ray Styles had the talent, the energy, and they had a cheeky cockney charm Mike and Nicky could exploit. Mud were quickly signed up to Mickey Most's Rack Records. Here's 
Here's Mud guitarist Rob Davis. He's written a few hits of his own now, you know. Remember Groove Jet by Spiller or I Can't Get You Out of My Head by Kylie? They sort of whisked us off our feet. I mean, we're so naive. They said, right, we're going to make you stars. We've got your first two hit singles and things like that. And we went, OK, all right. it's better than what we've been doing up to now. We might as well have some. Mud had a couple of minor hits before they broke through with the song that Chinny Chap had originally written for Sweet. Nicky Chin remembers. Sweet turned down Dynamite. We said to Mud, let's go in and do Dynamite. Mickey didn't fancy it. We said, we think it's a hit. We put it out. And I think it was about number 20 or something like that that did Top of the Pops and went straight to four the next week. It wasn't until we cut dynamite with them that their own personalities started to uh, surface. Then they started being that party band that they turned out to be. Mud were a colorful bunch of guys. Les Gray was a natural showman, drummer Dave Mount was a comedian, and Mud's own version of Steve Priest was Rob Davis. You know, the geeky guy with the perm, the Christmas bauble earrings, flared chiffon jumpsuit, and that unconvincing smile. He might not have been Marilyn Manson, but in those days, the sight of someone looking borderline transvestite on TOTP was frankly OTT, you see. When we got to, um top of the pops earlier on this guy was designer clothes was sort of camping it up for me then um the wardrobe at top of the pops came down with the earrings so it all got worse and worse by the record the flares got bigger the earrings got longer and it all got a bit out of hand you know? the band was uh, pushing rob to go to extremes because they had seen how steve priest had uh, been so effective with the suite doing that similar sort of thing and i think they figured well Hey, we got a guy like that. And Rob always looked a little uncomfortable with it because I think he was. I said I'd get down, get with it. Mike Chapman had shrewdly used the friendly rivalry between the Chinny Chap stable and other bands to develop his own potential as a hit maker. Here's Slade frontman and friendly rival Naughty Holder. When we broke through with such big success, I think um, Mike and Nicky, they saw in us what they could do with their own songs. And, and they did start to develop a different style of writing after our success with all the number ones we were getting. There was something about Slade that was totally different from anything else that was out there. And I felt uh, compelled to rip them off a little bit. My initial direction with Mud was very much similar to the direction that Slade was going. Everybody raise both your hands in the air! Everybody everywhere! I said I'd clap your head! The songs were very quirky pop songs. Mud's guitarist, Rob Davis. They had a semi-rock vibe. They captured the pop market and a bit of the rock audience as well. You know? We'd go out and do a, a sort of quite a heavy live set as well, and like punters would go, wow, they can play, you know? Unlike a lot of bands nowadays. <laughs> Mud's biggest hit and one of Chinny Chap's best sellers came in January 1974 when Tiger Feet beat off the sweet's teenage rampage to reach number one. It's a song that owes a lot to a can of white paint and yours truly. Here's Nicky Chin, followed by the then Rack promo executive Dave Most. Mike came up with the idea of Tiger Feet, and it sounded great. Mike Chapman asked me over to his house one day, and he said to me, Dave, he said, I'm doing some wallpapering. He then put this wallpaper against the wall, and he moved it across, because he obviously pasted it there, and he said, that's neat, that's neat. I really love your Tiger Feet. He said, what do you think of that one? I said, well, oh, sounds good. Yes, there were stripes of my wall paint on my feet, and yes, indeed, that's where Tiger Feet came from. Suddenly it dawned on me that That's Neat, rhymed with Tiger Feet, a song was born. Oh really? I didn't know that. Oh, I always thought it was a bit of a nursery rhyme. I was living at my mum and dad's at the time, and we were rehearsing it downstairs. My old man was ill upstairs. He came down and said, what's that load of rubbish you're playing number one four weeks later on, you know? 
The most prestigious number one of the whole year is, of course, the Christmas number one. And the seasonal race to top the pops had become as traditional as turkey or Christmas. It was usually a little slushy or kind of soft, as it had to appeal to a whole bunch of people who didn't normally buy many records. Think about those songs by guys like Wolf Harris, Benny Hill, and little Jimmy Osmond. Not exactly your run-of-the-mill rock and rollers, are they? Here's one guy who always enjoys Christmas. Or should I say, Christmas! Every year. Try to imagine a house that's not a home. But there obviously is never going to be a Christmas record to touch ours. So, I mean, lonely this Christmas is way down the list, really. That's where well, that's a matter of opinion, Nod. And it certainly didn't stop Chin and Chapman from having a go. So on a hot summer's day in 1974, they sat down to write the perfect Christmas song in an attempt to get mud to the top slot. Here's Mike Chapman. It will be lonely this Christmas. One of the ambitions of every English songwriter and record producer is to come up with that big Christmas number one. Everybody wants a number one record at Christmas time, and Chin and Chapman were no different to anybody else. If we did it with Susie or we did it with The Sweet, it would have to be a rock and roll Christmas record, and we might not capture the whole audience. They knew that mud was so hot in that year of 74. What we need is a song that will sell to grandma and grandpa, the three-year-olds and the four-year-olds and everybody in between. They were very mercenary, Chin and Chapman, in the way they went about things. And it was really a pastiche of an Elvis sound. And the record was ready in September, and I think everybody knew when they heard it that somebody was going to have to have a damn good record to beat us to number one. It was an absolute smash. It was doing about 90,000 a day at one point. And it was number one, embarrassingly, for Top of the Pops, into about the third week in January. It's Christmas. In the end, I think it was the sentiment of the song that took it to the top of the charts. Merry Christmas, darling, wherever you are. Thanks, Susie. You're doing a great job so far. But I'll just take it from here, just to spare your blushes. Susie Q had a more distinguished track record than some of the Chinny Chap acts that had preceded her. I started really, really young. My father's a musician. He raised all his five kids with musical training. We had our choice of anything we wanted to do. Well, I played bongos at seven in my dad's band. I then took classical piano for about six or seven years, and then at 14 I taught myself bass guitar, joined my first band, and we went immediately on the road. So from 1964, I was professional. In 1968, Susie formed Cradle, a family band which featured her sister Nancy on vocals. I was playing with groups like um, MC5, Bob Seger, Ted Nugent, Iggy Pop, Alice Cooper. Mickey was in America, in Detroit. He spotted her as the talent. She was playing bass. Mickey saw the show and he called me to the back of the hall and he said, would you like to come to England? I said, yeah, um, what do you do? Of course, I knew what he did. He said, I'm a producer. I said, oh, what's your name? He said, Mickey Most. I said, oh. He said, so would you like to come? I said, well, maybe. A year or so later, after Cradle had split, Susie arrived in town. Mickey made an album with her that didn't happen. I was going stir crazy. I didn't have a band together. I've never been off the road since the age of 14. I said to Mickey, I can't stand it anymore. I've got to do some gigs. So he said, okay, get a band. So I advertised in Melody Maker, formed a band, and we started to work. At some point, I think we did the Slade tour in 72. It was 73, I think. Thanks, Naughty. My pleasure. Okay. And Mickey had just signed up these two new writers, Nikki Chin and Mike Chapman. And he said to me after the tour, would you mind if I sent Nikki and Mike along to one of your shows, let them hear all your original material, and see if they can come up with a three-minute single? So they came along, and Mike went away that very night and came up with Can the Can. Chin and Chapman saw that Susie was a full-throttle rocker in an era where most women singers dress like Nana Muscuri. 
when we were in the studio making that, I remember Mike saying, Susie, we need something magical here. So I went in there and I did that scream, my trademark scream. And everybody went number one. I was a biker girl. I had leather jackets. I had blue jeans. I was real rock and roll. The guys fancied her. And the girls were able to say, well, I'd like to be like her. She didn't alienate the girls. They were ready to accept an American doing that. They wouldn't have been able to accept an English person doing that. On the scene at that time, no girls were making it. I think her number one was the first since Olivia Newton-John. It wasn't a girl era. I was the first one to go out there with a bass guitar and play it properly, lead the band, play poker, spit, drink, but keep my femininity. And nobody will deny that I was totally feminine. Ballsy, but feminine. Well, can, but, can. but what did the title mean? How can you can a can? Can the can is basically an impossibility. If you get one can of the same size and try and put one inside of the other, you can't. That's really what can the can is. Put your man in the can, honey. Well, she can't. It never really had any meaning, but uh, I could give it a lot of meaning. There's a phrase in America where you say can it, and that means keep it safe. So can the can means like, put your man somewhere safe. Mike used to use all my Americanisms and twist them into just little catchy phrases, even 48 Crash. I think 48 Crash is the best title of a song that I've ever come up with. He used to always say, oh, he's going through the male menopause. I said male menopause. He thought, hmm, when do men go through the male menopause? And he thought 48 Crash. That's what it's all about? Yeah, it's a midlife crisis song. The 48 crash about turning 48, and uh, it's a silk sash bash. We had Can the Can, 48 crash, Daytona Demon. And then it got to like 1974. Welcome to the die. We made the first album, We've done very well, sold a lot of records. And I remember Mickey saying to Mike, so funny, he said, Mike, now we need another number one. Mike went fine, and he went away and wrote Double Gate Drive. In 1974, well, it was an amazing year. It was the same time as the three-day week. Because, of course, one of the things that people do turn to is entertainment. And, of course, in the case of records, it was entertainment that wasn't too expensive, that you could play again and again and again. So, in fact, our records were selling hand over fist. It was unbelievable. There was that little space where there was number one, number two, and number three. We had Tiger Feet at number one. Devil Gate Drive by Susie Quattro at number two, and Teenage Rampage by Sweet at number four in the same week. Photography was number one, Teenage Rampage was number two, we were number three, and then we eventually went to number one, knocking mud off. And I thought, well, that's neat. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> There you go, Susie. Not too embarrassing, I hope. Thanks, Naughty. Not at all. I've always hated talking about myself, you know. Okay, everyone. Time to get your ears around another little slice of genius. I think if push came to shove, this was Mike Chapman's best moment. It was good that they brought their own names into the introduction. Ready, uh -huh. That was quite clever. Brand identification, if you like. It was so sort of camp, it was brilliant. I had never heard a record that actually introduced a band. Boy, you know, people are so concerned about knowing the individual's names, you know, John, Paul, Ringo, and why not introduce them at the front of the songs? This is very, very funny, and it was theatrical. I think we pulled it off. 
something. She's the passionate one. From that moment on, there wasn't a kid anywhere in the world that was a fan of the Sweets that didn't know their name. They were known individually. Robin Blitz was more than just a brilliant and original attention-grabbing introduction to a band who were by now barely on speaking terms. The whole song has been critically acclaimed as one of the great creations of the period. Producer Phil Wayman remembers the recording sessions when the suite were laying down ballroom blitz. There was so much electricity in that record. You could feel the aggression from the boys. I think that it probably is Sweet's finest moment. Without the old Sandy Nelson sort of drum kick, you know, from the 50s, plus a few of my 70s rock cliches in there with the guitar playing. And Brian Connolly's vocals are just incredible. But it was a hard record to make. It was a 17-hour lead vocal. When it came to the subtleties of some of those vocals, Brian was really out of his depth. Not because he couldn't sing them, but because he couldn't hear them. He didn't quite understand how to do those kind of vocals. Mike Chapman became more and more picky about what he wanted from Brian, and he became very, very specific. Brian was cut through the mill. Brian was pretty much close to tears by the time the right vocal came from him. There were tracks where we'd record where I would go out, stand behind him, crank my voice up in his headphones so that we actually sang the lead vocals together. There are some of those lead vocals on some of the sweet tracks where it's really Brian Connolly and Mike Chapman double track. Oh, it's been getting so hard Living with the things you do to me That sort of vibe wasn't natural for him. He just had to copy it. He had a real knack of getting performance out of people, whether you liked sometimes the abrasive attitude or whatever was necessary at that time. If the results are right, you have to say, well, fine. Marvel Blitz was something of a peak for Chin and Chapman as far as glam rock was concerned. There were still some great tunes to come. Sweet, for instance, had songs like Hellraiser, Teenage Rampage, and The Sixteens before they parted with Chinny Chap to pursue their own songwriting and producing ambitions. All my love, all my kissing, you don't know what you've been missing, oh boy. When you're with me, oh boy. The world will see that you were meant for me. Soon after Sweet defected, Mud Tooth flew the Chinny Chap coop. But they left behind a large archive of session tapes from which Chinny Chap and Rack plundered The Secrets That You Keep, Moonshine Sally, and an a cappella version of an old Buddy Holly number. Mud's version of Oh Boy went to number one. And as for me, well, I kept the faith. The Wild One and If You Can't Give Me Love both got into the top ten. And then there was another one of my favorites, Your Mama Won't Like Me, but I like to say, but your daddy will. For Mike Chapman, the secret of Chinny Chop's pop success was all about innovation, novelty, and keeping an eye on what the opposition were up to. Eight top ten singles, including three number ones in 1974, certainly marked a peak. But the music business was changing, and Nicky and Mike were shrewd enough to sense it. Mike, in particular, was looking for a way to move forward. He began spending more and more time in America looking for inspiration and a way to forge a direction on his own. When I first started going to the States in 74 and started listening to uh, American radio, what I noticed was music in America was the total antithesis to what was on English radio. There was no glam rock. They didn't listen to that kind of stuff. It was all about uh, folksy stuff, country stuff, and uh, the Eagles. Raven hair and ruby lips. I was uh, totally blown away by this stuff. I loved it. So I thought, well, I'm going to change direction. Shortly thereafter, I moved to Beverly Hills. She's a restless spirit on an endless flight. Right at that time, I had the new act that I had uh, found was Smokey. So they fit perfectly. So I figured Susie Quattro, I can make her sound more American because she is. 
and Smokey are sort of like the Eagles, so I can make those kind of records with them and leave the old glam rock thing behind. So that's how it sort of started to turn around. In Smokey, Mike and Nikki saw a whole new direction. Here's lead singer Chris Norman. The idea was that we were going to be like the Chin and Chapman's album band because they were looking for um, something different from the stuff that they were doing. They'd been sort of known as a like a, a hit pop factory and everything, and they wanted to be sort of taken a bit more seriously by doing albums and stuff. Looks. Before Chin and Chapman, we were called Kindness. And I think they saw us as like a Crosby, Stills and Nash type group because we were a bit like that live. The great thing about being you is you can do whatever you want to do. I heard uh, Chris singing a couple of Joe Cocker things. So I thought, my God, he had a very versatile voice, but his natural voice was this wonderful sort of husky, smoky sort of sound. And so I thought, oh, I got a name for him, Smokey. Pass it around. Pass it around was slightly drug orientated. Of course, it was pass the joint around. Radio 1 refused to play it. Because of the overt drug references, Smokey were a bit too toky for the airplay producers in the mid-70s BBC. The drugs didn't work as far as radio play was concerned. Even older and wiser marketing men like Rax Dave Most made the occasional mistake. And do you know how people talk? Yes, OK, past the duchy on the left-hand side. The first album we put out, we sent it round in cigarette cartons. Not a very good idea. They were very cautious of that, the BBC. They didn't want to promote smoking. Just one of those situations where you've got to say, wrong, wrong, wrong. Lack of airplay meant almost nobody picked up on Pass It Around. Lucky for Smokey, the Chinny Chap partnership had another great Mike Chapman tune up their sleeve with If You Think You Know How To Love Me. At the time, Chris Norman wasn't too happy about the soft rock sound that Chinny Chap were manufacturing for the group. We fancied ourselves as being kind of heavy rock with a bit of harmonies thrown in sort of band. And at that time, Chin and Chapman were considered to be more sort of pop. And we didn't really want to do that. We didn't want to go on that hit singles thing. Motorbike ride in the midday heat. If You Think You Know How to Love Me reached number three in Britain. Oh yes, we may walk on the wild, wild side of life. We went from sort of being sort of fairly heavy kind of guitars to doing this acoustic thing. And it was when we started to do the acoustic thing, and with If You Think You Know How To Love Me, which was the first hit, that we had that kind of West Coast sort of sound, if you like. And, and that's what started to happen for us, you know. So if you think you know how to love me. And then we had Don't Play Your Rock and Roll To Me, which was also an acoustic -y thing. But we were doing all right, and I think then the idea was that we wanted to break Europe bigger than we had been. We'd had a couple of small hits, but then the, the songs were just looking for hits after a while, you know. Don't play your rock and roll to me. Don't play your rock and roll to me was another top ten hit. Despite the honorable attempt to mold Smokey into an album band, the combination of Chinny Chap's instincts and the Rack Records philosophy still churned out the pop singles. Oh, I don't know why she's leaving or where she's going. Living Next Door to Alice was to become Smokey's signature tune. 20 years after first reaching the top five, it reappeared in the chart, this time with chanted obscenities, courtesy of so-called comic Roy Chubby Brown. But Alice was the song that shaped the public's perception of the band as a laid-back, polished country outfit. Chris Norman remembers how it happened. We were in America making an album. We agreed that we'd record it, but just for America, because we thought it could maybe do all right on the country charts or something. As soon as we got back to the UK and to Europe and everything, everybody was wanting to put that out as the single. It turned out to be the biggest selling record that we'd had up to then. And it kind of changed the whole direction that we were going in because after that we were sort of no no live that's the band that did live next door to Alice. Oh, I'll never get used to not living next door to Alice. As we already said, Chinny Chap's interest in Smokey showed that the great glam gravy train had run out of puff. The 
Throughout the Glam period, Mike Chapman had become an increasingly skilled and heavyweight songwriter and producer. He'd had some good mentors in Mickey Most and Phil Wayman, but for a long time, Mike had been thinking that he had outgrown his collaborators. He desperately wanted to pursue his own career, and for that to happen, he felt he needed to put some distance between himself and his partner, Nicky Chin. For Mike, at least, the productive life of Chinny Chap was all over. Yeah. When I got to America, to me, that was my out. I realized that by moving there, I would be able to break this partnership up. Nikki Chin. When things start to get difficult, it can get a bit like a divorce. When Nikki Chin and myself started writing songs together back in 1970, we would uh, hang out at his apartment. I'd thump away on the guitar. He wasn't a musician. He didn't really have any knowledge of music. And out of that sort of hanging out together started to come some interesting but uh, somewhat lame little pop songs. Then as the songs started to change, as the songs started to have more substance, I started to notice that I was growing as a songwriter and I noticed that nothing was happening with him. I think it's a subjective and arrogant point of view. I mean Mike seems to think that there were problems between us in the mid-70s. It began to become very, very strained. Slowly but surely, the relationship started to break down. I can't possibly understand where he's coming from, and I also can't understand how it would take seven years to break up with someone if you really wanted to. So clearly he didn't want to. So show me, show me everything you do. We were having the hits. That was keeping us together. Mickey Most and everybody else around us, they were happy. They thought it was a happy relationship. And I was doing my best not to hurt him. Mike and Nicky had fallen out on a profound level. And although a few great songs like Exile's Kiss You All Over leaked out, they were really no more than the death rows of Chinny Chap. I'm in the phone booth, it's a one across the hall. If you don't answer, I'll just bring it off the wall. I know he's there, but I just try to call. So we've been hanging on the telephone. So we've been hanging on the telephone. The irretrievable breakdown between Mike and Nikki was signaled to the rest of the world in 1978, when Mike Chapman was called in to produce songs for new wave flag bearers, Blondie. Here's Debbie Harry, Chris Stein, and Clem Burke from Blondie. We were playing at the Whiskey for a couple of weeks in LA. So Mike came down and uh, said he never laughed so hard in his life. <laughs> and, performance, um, right? That was it. And uh, <laughs> we became best friends. <laughs> <laughs> he was a smart guy, and I think he saw the potential in the relationship immediately. I was very flattered because I knew who Blondie was. I was certainly aware of their presence in the underground punk that was going on in New York and L.A. So I saw that as an enormous opportunity to uh, take another step, and a step that would finally give me some satisfaction in terms of credibility. Credibility was something that Mike was certainly justified in craving. After all, although he's now regarded as one of the great pop songwriters and producers of the 20th century, it wasn't always the case. The benefits of Mike's new partnership worked both ways. Here's Clem again. I was really excited about the prospect of us working with him because not only is he a great producer, he is a very interesting commercial songwriter. He's been involved with 70 number one songs, I'm told, which is insane, really. Together, Mike and the band made the Parallel Lines album. He had the experience to know what was required if he was going to turn Blondie into a commercial success. What they were actually frightened of was that somebody would come in and clean them up. They didn't want to be cleaned up. They wanted to, to stay funky and punk. I said to them, look, I'm not here to screw up your music. I'm, I'm here to, to get the world to listen to it. If you want the world to hear your music, we have to make it palatable to radio. 
At that point in my career, eight years down the line, I knew how to do that, and I knew how to do it well. Yeah, he was quite a taskmaster in the studio on Parallel Lines record, which is the first record that we worked with him on. I remember being very nervous about it because I had come out of these uh, successful but tumultuous years. And, uh, of course, Debbie and Chris were very protective of their artistry, and they wouldn't give much away, you know. I was on trial. Clem Burke of Blondie. He would be in the studio being very hands-on, making the music up to a certain standard that we had not reached. At last, Mike got the credibility. Parallel Lines was both a critical and commercial hit. On singles such as Picture This and Hanging on the Telephone, Chapman smoothed the sharp punk edges into a more palatable sound, but one which still conveyed a thoroughly edgy attitude. It was something that Mike brought out in them the very first day they worked together. The album's third single was pure disco. It was also groundbreaking, and for the first time, it showed Blondie's versatility. That very first day at rehearsal, one of the songs they had played to me was called Once I Had a Love. I said, this is fabulous. How do you want to do this song? And she said, I love Donna Summer. <laughs> I said, okay, well... Uh, Let's make it Donna Summer. We took Once I Had a Love, and I said, well, that's a bit of a clumsy title. You know, there's a great line in this song when you're singing Heart of Glass. I said, maybe we should call it Heart of Glass. Heart of glass. And she went, that's great, Mike. From that point on, it was Heart of Glass, and then we discoed it. Here's Chris Stein from the band. Heart of Glass could be nowadays done in maybe a day with MIDI, which is you know, musical instrument digital interface, is the language that all computer instruments share. Mike wanted every little nuance to be totally on time. Every 16th note had to be completely on the mark, and we just weren't used to doing it. Debbie looked at me and said, uh, you really made um, Heart of Glass sound great, Mike, thanks. I just about broke into tears. She was this tough broad. I mean, she didn't want some glitzy, glammy pop producer coming in and screwing up her music. And she thought that's what I was going to do. And Chris said, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, you really did a great job. Sounds uh, terrific. Before we ran into Mike, we never thought about that level of perfection. And suddenly we were, it was just like school's out. Well, school was in. And school was in, but not just for the band. Throughout his three-album collaboration with Blondie, Mike Chapman himself did a whole lot of learning. She and Chris said, look, uh, we've got this other idea, which is, uh, it's got a rap in it. I said, uh, it's got a what? And she said, well, you know, like Grandmaster Flash. She and Chris were hooked up with these people in New York. They were always 10 steps ahead of me and everybody else musically. Over the next two days, Chris and Debbie wrote the song as we went along. Then there was this big long gap at the end, and then there was a guitar solo. So, Debbie, what are we doing in this like uh, 85 bar section in the middle? She said, that's the rap. I used to do a lot of writing as I was singing. Mike sort of liked that. He was always, you know, what's going to go here, you know? So then uh, I finally had worked out the entire rap. So the two of them stood in front of me. I swear to God, in 10 minutes, they wrote that whole rap. And out she goes. And in, I think, two takes, she did the rap on Rapture. Well, now you see what you want to be. Just have your party on TV. Because the man from Mars won't beat up all. I did it once. He says, okay, we got, we got it. I think he was just like so yeah, freaked out that he took it in one take and he never did that. <laughs> Mike's work with Blondie repaid him with huge satisfaction. It set him free of his partnership with Nicky Chin and showed the whole world that his talent was unique. Among the many hits he produced for the band were Dreaming, Union City Blue, Atomic, and The Tide Is High. It was an amazing string. 
I have no doubt that uh, my work with Blondie and my experiences with Blondie were the most important thing that I've done uh, in the United States. Mike was now living in America permanently. During the late 70s and the 80s, he translated his talent into such stunning success that it's impossible to do more than give a taste of it in such a short program. But here's a couple of more highlights of Mike Chapman's American Dream. I accomplished the number one and two records twice. I had uh, Hot Child in the City and Kiss You All Over at number one and two together, and then they switched places. Then about a year later, I produced a band called The Knack, one of those uh, songs that seems to never die, My Sharona. So I had uh, My Sharona and uh, Heart of Glass at number one, and they switched places too. I accomplished the number one and two twice, but never the top three. Did that in Germany. I think we had the top four in Germany in one week at one point. And the top three, of course, in England back in 74. By the early 80s, Mike Chapman had become recognized as one of the true aristocrats of the American music industry. His profile as a producer and songwriter meant he was courted by some of music's biggest stars. And you don't get much bigger than Tina Turner. Prisoner of your love. Writing for uh, Tina happened because uh, 1979, 1980, Holly Knight, who was the uh, keyboard player and um, main songwriter in a band that was signed to me at Dreamland Records, a band called Spider. Oh yes, I'm touched by this show of emotion. From the day that I met Mike, I always thought he was very charismatic and glamorous. Stand. Ultimately, if you look at his body of work, it's cool. Holly and I started collaborating on songs. We uh, sat down one day and wrote a song called Better Be Good To Me. It was the first song we ever wrote, and uh, he produced it. The song was written for her band, but um, the spider went down with Dreamland. A year or so later, Tina Turner was in the process of making her comeback. She flipped out over the song, absolutely loved it. I heard the story that she got up and danced around and said, this is great, and this is so me where I'm at lyrically. Next thing we knew, she was recording it, and it was a huge hit for her. After the partnership with Mike had dissolved, Nikki tried songwriting with new partners, but went into virtual retirement over a decade ago. However, he still did manage a lot of the business side of Chinny Chap. But now, Nikki has returned to his notebook and is working with Dave Howells of Stock, Aitken Waterman, Steve Mack, Steve Diamond, and Jurgen Olofsson. He sees it as a great new start. Beyond Glam, Mike Chapman wrote or produced hits for acts as diverse as Altered Images, Tony Basil, The Divinals, and Lita Ford, and Pat Benatar, for whom he and Holly Knight wrote Love is a Battlefield. Love is a battlefield. And although he never again became quite as prolific as he was at the start of the 80s, Mike, either together with or separate from his former partner Nikki Chin, was largely responsible for sales of 40 million singles around the world. Mike Chapman's recipe for chart success is fairly simple, as he explains with reference to the monster hit he and Holly Knight wrote for Tina Turner. I've always looked at pop singles as sophisticated commercial jingles. The purpose of a jingle is uh, to sell a product. The purpose of a hit single is to sell an artist. So it was like this giant commercial for Tina Turner. I am Tina Turner, I am simply the best. And when she does her live shows, it comes across that way. You're simply the best. It was amazing, he just somehow picked something that was sort of like a phrase of the 90s, you know. Even the term simply the best seems to be bandied around an awful lot more these days than it ever was prior to the song being a hit. It's quite astonishing the amount of commercial and advertising usage that that song has managed to conjure up. 
In America, everywhere you look, there's a place called the Coffee Bean, and their motto on everything that you see is simply the best. And then you look on, like, a car dealership, it's simply the best. Well, Mike, I think you're simply the best, and that's why I'm still working with you. And, Nikki, you're pretty good, too. I hope you've enjoyed this story of one of the most successful music business partnerships of all time, as much as I've enjoyed telling you the tale. I'm Susie Quattro, and you've been listening to Chinny Chap, a journey into the heart of glam and beyond. You're simply-